Hi everyone, um, we hope you're well um, and you're adjusting well to these new ways of working that we're having to do at the moment. Um, myself and Nikki have a few suggestions for a few projects for you, but we're going to give you a bit of an introduction to who we are um, and then talk a bit more about the backgrounds of the type of projects that we could set you up on um, as well. So for me, I'm, I'm Lisa Humphreys. Um, I've worked for Cranfield University now for about five years. I'm an explosive formulation chemist. I know it sounds very funky, quite cool, uh, and very rare, but um, fun job. And Nikki, my colleague, who will introduce herself now as well. Hi, I'm currently a senior explosives laboratory technician at Cranfield University, and I work with Lisa. Um, in the past, I've also been an HLTA in a primary school and I taught a lot of science. And prior to that, I was a formulator for a pharmaceutical company um, and have a patent for soft gelatin um, formulations. So we should really start with what is a formulation? Well, formulation is a, a mixture of uh, chemicals. Um, the, the ingredients specifically shouldn't, be, um, shouldn't react chemically because ideally you want a physical mixture of the ingredients to kind of complement one another and work in harmony together to produce a desired effect. I've listed a few examples of formulations, all of which you're probably quite familiar with. Uh, paints, sun cream, which me with my complexion desperately need, and uh, some crisps, because who, who doesn't like crisps? Okay, so formulations are a very important part of creating products. It's very rare that we have a single component that will completely fulfill um, its purpose. So when we mix different components, we can actually enhance um, the effectiveness of one or both of the components in, in the um, formulation. For example, your body requires calcium to uh, function and to uh, have strong bones and teeth. Now the body struggles to take up calcium by itself, but if you add some vitamin D to the formulation, then it, that helps the body with the uptake of calcium. So you'll find if you look at food supplements that generally if it's a calcium food supplement, it will also have vitamin D as one of its components. Virtually all industries use formulators. Okay, we've got a good list of um, industries here. Some are quite common. You'd expect it from cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, things like that. But the defense industry where Lisa and I come in is probably something not that you don't readily think of. So let's start with how we go about creating a formulation. First of all, it's really important to actually figure out what your application is, like what, what um, what is it you're trying to address? What, what will the formulation help you to do? So I mentioned sun cream earlier. Certainly, again, my complexion, I need factor 50. Um, but then there's other people who don't necessarily need that same sort of level of sunscreen, sunscreen protection. So they could have maybe, I don't know, factor 10, 15. Um, they'll have two very different formulations. You have to therefore select appropriate ingredients that can accomplish uh, your goal. Whilst you've got your list of ingredients, you've got to, again, it's, it's got to be a physical mixture. So you want to evaluate um, and check that the ingredients don't chemically interact, that they don't necessarily say produce an entirely different chemical, because that could be, uh, that could have a whole variety of consequences. Once we've done that, we're happy that we've got a really lovely physical mixture of the ingredients. You have to decide how much you want of each component. Um, again, the, the sunscreen, the factor 50 versus the factor 15, you could still have all the same ingredients, but it might just be do, to do with the contribution um, of each in, in terms of the, the whole, the finished product. You've really got to also think about how you add the ingredients into to make your mixture, because it's not as easy as just adding all in one goal. You might have a better way of doing it because otherwise you might get um, separation of the materials if you start adding in things in a complex way. So you've got to really, you've got, you've got to put a lot of thought into that as well. So you know you're, you've got to mix the materials, but how long should you mix them for? Once you've got your formulation out there, you've got to analyse it and make sure that it goes back to um, meeting your initial criteria. You might have to have other processing requirements like uh, cutting it down into a specific shape or other, other little things like that. The ratio of ingredients, you don't have to start entirely from new ingredients to, to achieve the desired effect. So have a look at the various different steps and see where it could have went off. So if we look at um, the industries we talked about earlier, just a few of them as a subset, um, we've got a key ingredient for each sort of area. So agrochemicals produce a lot of different types of formulation, one specifically fertilizers for growing our crops. Um, ammonium nitrate is a lovely key ingredient in that area. Defense, uh, so mine and Nikki's area. Key ingredient, explosives generally. So an example of an explosive, 
TNT. Uh, pharmaceutical, uh, we, they use what we refer to as an active pharmaceutical ingredient. So it's the thing that has uh, the medicinal properties. But um, it can, paracetamol, which is the example we've got here, can have actually quite a bitter taste. Um, so we need to add some other things in there to make it a little bit easier for a person to actually take. Binders are used to improve the texture and thickness of formulations. If you've ever looked into a box of muesli and noticed that the nuts always seem to be on the top. Well, this is because particles with different properties like size, shape and density um, will separate with the finer powders going to the bottom and the larger um, particles will move to the top. Binders form a structure that reduces this effect. We also add stabilizers and preservatives. Um, they use to maintain the structure of the food and extend the shelf life. We also use things like surfactants. Uh, now, what they, they generally do is basically reduce the surface tension between uh, a variety of different materials. Um, you'll find them most often used in things like cleaning products uh, and uh, toiletries. So laundry detergents, soaps, shampoos. Another thing you might want to do is add um, a colourant. Now, colourants are typically added to make products say, more visually appealing, but it's also really good because it can serve as a means to identify and discern particular brands. Now, colourants can come in the form of um, synthetic or natural products. Um, natural products um, are examples. Um, we've got beetroot, turmeric. Anyone knows that they, they're, they're typical culprits um, in terms of staining our clothes and not really being able to even fix them even with a good deal vanish. Um, dyes are, are typically water soluble um, and used often for dyeing fabrics. Pigments tend to be the sort of insoluble compounds that you'll find in things like paints and, and plastics. Okay so as um, we said earlier a lot of pharmaceuticals and things don't taste very nice and a lot of times they don't smell very nice either. Um, we do have chemicals that smell really, really good, and we can use these as opposed to their natural counterparts. So if we take strawberry flavouring, for example, natural strawberry is, is lovely flavour um, and a lovely smell, but it's very weak if we get it from the strawberry itself. Okay, so if we decide we can produce that some other way, we could mix something called cinnamic acid with methyl alcohol. And you get a compound called methyl cinnamate, um, which smells really strongly of strawberries. We can use a lot less of this and it has a much longer shelf life than using fresh natural strawberry. Ingredient preparation. We normally have dry ingredients. Okay, so um, although ingredients can be wet as well, if we start with dry ingredients, we need to look at the particle size. It's really important to have particle size um, uniformity. If we um, have a formulation that works beautifully with one set of raw materials and we go to another supplier and get a different type of um, the same material, say icing sugar compared to granulated sugar for example, then it could have a completely different effect on our formulation. So let's look now at the method or recipe as it's more commonly known for your for your all you bakers and chefs out there. Uh, we have to start by looking at, at things like our mixing technique. Now that can be manual or so literally bowl and spoon or it could be mechanical. So we've got things like your hand mixers or your, your stand mixers. Now as much as I'm saying that specifically to cooking and uh, baking, we actually use these in the explosive sector as well. You need to decide whether you're going to do incremental additions, which is more commonly done, or if it's actually suitable to do it all in one go. With incremental additions, it's not just the case of one ingredient at a time. It might be, especially when I'm, whenever I've been baking a cake, I don't just throw all the flour in at once because you really get, it makes it really hard for the mixer to actually really incorporate all the, all the dry ingredient. So you add a little bit at a time and that can really help actually with, with the end products in terms of quality. Now I've put a whole little tab here saying curing, cooking, baking conditions because it's a whole collection on the last stage so you can change things like the temperature uh, or the time of um, when you're using an oven and um, you also might want to look at the selection of your container or mold whether that's a silicon um, mold or uh, an aluminium tin if you're looking at quality assessment you want to address the performance of, of your mixture so performance is very specifically dependent on your actual application another thing you want to look at are things like uh, reproducibility can you make that same mixture uh, 
the same time and time again as your formulation scalable. So obviously, whenever you're developing a, a formulation, you will you'll start it small. Uh, can can you go from say a few grams to kilograms, tons of stuff? Texture, taste, color intensity. Again, they're specific for an application. Um, I certainly don't fancy tasting any explosives anytime soon. I don't know about you, Nikki, but it's not it's no. not one of our it's not one of our assessment criteria. But certainly for baking and cooking, you want to get the taste just right. Uh, shelf life um, is very important. So Nikki was talking earlier about um, stabilizers and preservatives. You can use things like packaging to help extend that to basically protect it from environmental conditions. So I mean. We're obviously trying to do a little bit away with like plastic packaging, but there's lots of other things like wax sealed paper that we're using right now as another means to help um, protect um, various food products. Also, can I consider the final stages um, of a formulation is the looking at the disposal or the recyclability. But disposal should really be thought of at the very beginning of, 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 of thinking about developing in a formulation. There's a phrase that we use in this industry called from, grade, from cradle to grave. And that's just being respectful of the fact that you're developing something, but you really do have to think about how it's going to be disposed of at the end or potentially recycled. So it's really important for our explosives industry because we might be want to develop an explosive formulation that will do a, a desired thing. But then if it doesn't necessarily do what you want it to or, it's, or if it's reached its, its um, end of shelf life, what are you going to do with it? Because you can't just leave explosives lying around. You, you've got to have some sort of plan ready for, um, for when that happens. So this is the projects that we've came up with, developing a weird and wonderful Willy Wonka-esque piece of confectionery. Um, you can choose the type of confectionery you want to start with. Again, have a look into different recipes. Um, the weirder the better, really. Um, if, he, if he can invent a lickable, lickable edible wallpaper, why can't you? Um, the worksheet that we've got has sort of given hints towards um, jelly sweets and formulations for those. Um, but think about messing with people's senses as well so just because a strawberry is red in nature does something strawberry flavored have to be red yeah. could you confuse somebody by making it a completely different color or and, and think about textures as well certainly one of the things i might start creating soon enough is anything something to add um, adding in popping candy because that's always fun that's that's a very different uh, sort of mouthfeel so there's lots you can do there We've also got um, summer styling. So actually looking back at those colorants that we talked about earlier, um, can you create your own design um, using um, natural products? So I talked about beetroot and turmeric, but there's loads out there. Can you, can you design something using these materials? Now it's, it's not just using one material though. So as much as we're talking about dyes, think about how you want it to stick to the material because you may have to add something that will help um, solidify that dye in place. Let's also think about what it is you're actually going to dye. Now, normally we think when we think of dyeing, we think of dyeing fabrics and colours. Look at that's called the substrate, the, the base material that you put it on. Well, there are plenty of other things. What about paper or eggs? Try and find different substrates. Do all fabrics work? Cotton yeah. isn't the only fabric that we have. Try others. We've also got kind of in line with the um confectionery is to develop a decadent and delicious dessert so yeah this, this is again another sort of technical challenge and it's actually trying to make you think more about that influence of particle sizes so as um, Nikki mentioned earlier looking at the differences between castor sugar icing sugar granulated sugar if you start using them in different ways what kind of outcome will it, what effect will it have on the on the product Yes, what effect will it have on the taste or uh, the mouthfeel? It's very important with food to talk about mouthfeel, how something actually um, reacts inside your mouth to give you that feeling of pleasure or disgust. Mm. And the last one, which is one of my favourites because it makes me think of Harry Potter, um, conjuring up some magical potions. So can you create a very, obviously we're looking at mocktails here. So can you use uh, various different fruit juices um, possibly even oil-based things to start actually um, creating different textures. So we've got an example here looking at um, a gradient of different sort of density um, in terms of your the, the colour distribution in a, in a co in, well, not cocktail but a mocktail. Could you do something similar or could you create different textures in there as well because you can get almost smoothie based like ones as well so can you develop something like that and obviously you've got to make it a showstopper as well so it's got to it's got to look good. Yeah, these, these are Sorry. 
look at fruit purees, um, look at natural colorings as well. Just because turmeric tend, tend to be used in things um, like savory products, doesn't mean to say they can't be used in sweet things as well. Um, and density, sugar syrups are very interesting for their density products. Yeah. So basically crack on, um, have fun with the, the projects, pick one that you like if, if, you, if, you, if you choose to, if, you, if, you, if you'd like to do one. Um, and let us know what you think.